welcome on into Salt City FC. I am your host, Jay Catch. We are back again this week. I'm joined, as always, by my fearless co-host, Sean Walker. Sean, how are you, buddy? Oh, you're talking to me. Yeah, I'm talking oh, to you. Oh, that's me. That's me. Hey, Jake, how you doing? Hey. <laughs> hey there. Awkward radio oh, silence okay. ensues now. That was golden radio. Thank that, you very much. That, that was, was pretty good. Golden. Golden radio. All right, Sean, we are back. That was, I dare say, that was as good as either goal scored in the Real Salt Lake organization uh, top flight last week. Oh, good point, yeah. Yeah. Because there yeah. were two scored, well, three scored by the top flight divisions of the team. and <laughs> Maybe two or three. Last week. Last, oh, last week. Oh, yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, you are correct. Last week. That's on me. That's on me. There we go. But yeah, we are Salt City FC talking soccer. I'm going to start things off this week, In though. the city of Salt. In the city of Salt, absolutely. We're going to be talking about um, – we're going to start things off this week. We usually start off with Real Salt Lake, but because they had a bye over the weekend and we had our little emerge pod um, come out after their match. I mean, we don't need to rehash no. Real Salt Lake and New York City FC, right, guys? No. no. Right? We're Tweet gonna, at us at Salt City FC if you think we're wrong. I don't think we do though. We're gonna trigger some PTSD if we <laughs> yeah, probably, rehash that. Probably. All right, let's, let's give the ladies some love. Exactly. Stuff. We're gonna talk about the Utah Royals here, Sean. I was not able to make it out to the match, but you were there. Nineteen thousand plus on hand. Uh, first ever home match in Utah Royals FC history. What were your overall takeaways from from the mo- momentous day? Well, I think the first one right there is just that 19,203 at Rio Tinto Stadium, a veritable sellout, standing room only, Uh, an actual sellout because they did lower the capacity by about 1,500 because of a concert by something called a Rachel Platten. Something called a Rachel Platten? All of you kids can get at me. Apparently, she's a big deal. I guess. Hey. She's a thing. My wife had to fill me in on who Rachel Platten Um, was. Yeah, so she's kind of important. So that dropped the capacity a little bit by about 1,500 seats. But still, 19203, that's the second largest in non-Portland crowd in NWSL history. Hey. That's not bad. Already some history there yeah, for, that's not bad. For, the, for the women. Yeah, now Portland, Portland Thorns are obviously, they're a little bit freakish in the league. They play at Providence Park, the same place as the Timbers. Uh, so they regularly draw like 10,000, something yeah. like that. They've had... They've had, I think, like eight or nine matches that are above that mark. But outside of the city of Portland, um, is Orlando? When, yeah, when you're when you're around the twenty thousand mark, you're basically talking about the Orlando Pride home opener last year in twenty sixteen. Okay, uh, they played that one at the Citrus Bowl. Oh, all right. And then uh, Utah Royals FC on Saturday. So, hey, props. congratulations, no. Utah. Uh, you've made history as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. Sadly, though, Sean. They did not go out and get the result they that everyone was hoping for. No, they did not get a win. No. And I still thought for the most part that Salt, um, Utah Royals, I want to call them Salt Lake, the Utah Royals played well in this match. And if not for a wonder strike by the Chicago Red Stars, it might have been a nil-nil draw. Yeah, 27th minute goal by Danny Colaprico. Um, absolutely beautiful goal. Yeah. I mean, gorgeous. You. So I saw some fans on Twitter faulting Abby Smith for not making that save in goal. I, I don't think you can fault her. I don't think you can fault that defense. I mean, that's, no. that's an incredible goal, an incredible strike. Uh, you really have to give props to Cola Prico, who mm-hmm. just kind of puts her foot on the end of a rebound just outside of the box. I mean, she's 22 yards from goal, somewhere in there, right at the top of the, the semicircle, yeah. um, and just hits it perfectly. One of only two shots on goal the Red Stars had all game. And she converts it. Yeah, and she just happened to convert it. She put it in the upper ninety. Like, yeah, I, yeah. If you can say that Abby Smith should have gotten to that, I'm not sure that many. If, if the MLS equivalent of that type of goal, I'm not sure many keepers in the world can can stop a shot like that. I'm sorry. It's just that was a glorious, glorious goal. Yeah, I, I think Abby Smith is going to find herself uh, in the national team sooner rather than later. I think she's one of the more underrated goalkeepers in the NWSL. Um, She's probably a backup on this team once okay. Nicole Barnhart gets healthy. Uh, knock on wood, we'll see when that is exactly. She's still uh, dealing with some ankle issues and whatnot, but but I, I think Abby Smith is an absolute treasure, great goalkeeper, and Danny Colaprico just one-timed her shot. Perfect shot, yeah. perfect placement, perfect instant, instance. 
Um, not much you can do there. On the other end, there were a few things that I think the Royals probably could have done a little better. Well, yeah, I thought in their two road matches to start the season, they generated more offense. Um, Gunny got unlucky to not score on a couple of her chances in the first two matches. I felt like she um, didn't necessarily have her best match in this home opener. But, um, yeah, I'm with you, Sean. I think there, there are things to correct going forward. They're going to be back out on the road this week. They head to all the way to Cary, North Carolina, if I'm not mistaken, to take on the North Carolina Courage. Lake um, Med Soccer Park. All right. But... Um, I want to talk, Sean. Well, okay. First thing, what um, what is the most glaring issue for the Royals, considering they need to generate some offense, get goals? I guess is the biggest thing. What what, what is your most glaring issue for, in your opinion? Yeah, no, it's just that. I mean, in in general, they're creating chances, but they're not finishing very well. They don't have a true out and out striker okay. right now that's healthy on this team. They're playing in kind of a hybrid four four two. Partial four two three one. Diana Matheson's playing up top. I mm-hmm. think she's playing a little bit further, a little bit higher than maybe she likes to play. Oh yeah, absolutely. Gunny's sort of their attacking facilitator, and and she's a great player. Don't get me wrong, but there's not that target player. There's not that that big presence that can hold the ball up and that can really that that, that can really kind of strike fear into opposing teams' defenses. So, so much. you mean both of the top flight teams in Salt Lake have issues with their striking core? Weird. I know, shocking. Weird, right? Okay, well, uh, the Royals. The Royals did. Uh, they brought in as a sub, seventy seventh minute. She she didn't have a ton of time to affect the game, but uh, Amy Rodriguez yeah, gonna, came I, off the bench. Right? I wanted to bring her up, and I think a healthy A Rod is game changing for this Royal side right now because she is the exact kind of player that can fill that role and that can do wonders for this Royals team. I mean, they've, they've proven to be very good in the back. Very good. I mean, mm-hmm. they've only given up uh, they've given up two goals all year. Yes. One from the run of play, that wonder strike from Cole Aprico. Yeah. Again, I'm not faulting anybody for that. The only other goal they've given up was a penalty kick exactly. that may or may not have been legit, depending on who you ask, uh, to Marta. Here. It wasn't. I did. It may or may not have. I'll, I'll let you guys decide. I won't. It, it was not fine. a handball, but that's just um, me. But, yeah, but, I mean, two goals for three matches. If yeah. The defense has done its job. They've done a very nice job. It's just the, the offense needs to get in and be able to, to generate more chances, uh, finish on frame a little bit more often, and I think a healthy A-Rod um, is kind of the, the, in a lot of ways, not the magic elixir because that never really exists. No, but, but... but it. It'll go a long way. Well, Amy Rodriguez is a world class forward. We've seen her with the U.S. Women's National Team. She's and you, you mentioned the fact that you need a striker that strikes fear in people. Well, Amy Rodriguez has been out of the game for a year. She tore her ACL in their home opener last year, so she's been out for a year. And that was her first game in a year. Exactly after the birth of her second child. Yeah. So if she can get back into form, we're talking about maybe the answer for the Royals right there. But it's going to take her some time, like you mentioned. She came on in the 77th minute, 13 minutes of game action. It's tough to come on and generate much unless you're a certain player named Zlatan Ibrahimovic. But we'll get to him in here in a little bit. A-Rod's a great player. Yeah. She's not Zlatan. No. Sorry. Sorry, Amy. Nope. Like, if you're listening to this podcast, I'm sorry. I apologize. I don't want to offend you. Uh, but you're you're not Zlatan. <laughs> <laughs> Very few people are. Yeah, Let's put it that way. Zlatan, Zlatan is singular. Zlatan, yeah. Zlatan is Zlatan. Zlatan. Yeah, there we go. That's the easiest way to say it. All right, Sean. Well, um, you had a chance after the match, was well along with the rest of the media, to catch up with Kelly O'Hara, get her thoughts on the home opening home opener for Utah Royals FC. So we'll play that right now. Here's Kelly O'Hara. Just being smart, working back into it. Um, I wish I felt better than I did after 45 minutes, but uh, yeah, it's just part of the process of coming back from injury. Just trying to be smart. You and I talked earlier in the week about on the ball um, and that. How would you assess that, especially in the first 45 when you were out there? Uh, not great. I think we need to be a lot better on the ball collectively. Um, but it's early in the season, and that's part of the process, working through that and just learning each other's tendencies. Were you the down there when they, when they scored the goal? Yeah. What did you see the um, I was marking in the box. Cross came in, I think clearance to the top of the box, and unmarked player able to get a shot off, so can't let that happen. Uh, what 
was the atmosphere like for you on the field? Uh, I mean, it was incredible. Can't can't thank the people of Utah enough, the front office, for all the work they did to get people in the stands and just people showing up. Um, obviously not the result we wanted. We want to give the fans wins every time they come here, especially the number that we got today. Um, and that's my whole focus going forward. Um, I think it's the teams as well. So the atmosphere was incredible, and I'm hoping that it stays that way this whole season and that we can start to produce for the fans. Is there still a little bit of a feeling in the locker room of it's a long season, got some things to make up, but, but it's still a long season? Yeah, I mean, we're this is the third game of the season, and everyone who's played in this league knows it's a grind. And um, some teams that start off super hot tend to fizzle at the end, and some teams that struggle in the beginning uh, come on hot at the end. So we're just going to look to build, and we got to get better. End of story. The goal notwithstanding, how did you feel about the defensive performance today? Um... It was all right. You know, obviously, when you give up a goal, it's hard to say it was good. Um, but not that many chances. So I think that's one positive you can take away from the defense. That was U.S. International and Utah Royal star Kelly O'Hara, who, Jake, I think she's going to become a fan favorite here sooner rather than later. Uh, great interview there, but not just what she said, but how she said it. Mm-hmm. She's kind of blunt. She gets to the point. Yeah, well, um, I think a lot of people were really impressed with what Albert Rusnak said in the post game after the New York City FC loss for Real Salt Lake because he doesn't mince words. He'll lay, he'll lay it out for you. I think Kelly O'Hara is very similar in that way. Like, Good information, but also not afraid to call it how it is. And people in the state of Utah, I think they'd app- they appreciate that from their sports teams and their, the figures on those teams. I think they appreciate just straight-up honesty. I don't, they don't like sugarcoating it as much as some people may say that. I think that sports fans in the state enjoy when they have somebody that's blunt and direct and just to the point. Yeah, and, and she, I mean, she didn't just point fingers at, at her whole team. She said, hey— Everybody just needs to get better. Um, that's the end of the story. And and she was pointing the finger as much at herself as anybody else. Yeah. I mean, she struggled with some health issues. She started that match, but came off at halftime with a little bit of a hamstring tweak that she picked up in Houston. Uh, I thought Cindy Miramontes finished out the match perfectly fine. Yeah. I, I I thought she played a great match. Um, but but just O'Hara, just plain and simple, said things need to get better. We've got to this, be this, better. Yeah, this team needs to gel. They need to they need to get back together. And it certainly doesn't help that uh almost half the teams, seven or eight players something like that didn't get in until Thursday night to Salt Lake yes. City after flying overseas. Gunny was in Iceland at the start of the week. Yep. Uh Katrina Gorey is getting back this weekend uh from Australia's World Cup qualifying, mm-hmm. so that'll help their their defensive depth a little bit there, but but so there are a lot of international on the a lot of internationals on this team, and, and they're just getting back and, and kind of in regular season form, if you will. And that's just, I mean, that's part of the disadvantage of having a lot of international caliber players on your squad is, yeah, they're great players, but they need time to get in with their teammates, mm-hmm. kind of come together, develop a little bit of a chemistry, a little bit of a bond. And and uh, I think that'll eventually come. Um it's just a matter of when now. Well, yeah. See, the thing with the Royals, since they have started this franchise here in Utah, Sean, is... Five with, months ago. Yes. But with all the international um, caliber talent they have, what you just talked about has been an ongoing issue. Their preseason was disrupted by players seemingly in and out of the lineup every other week with some international duty. And they have, yeah, you mentioned there were players still kind of getting back into town last week off of international duty. You mentioned Gory coming back from Australia this week. So, yeah, I'm with you. It's just going to take some time to gel. And once they do, they are set up, I think, to have some success here. All right, should we transition over to the men's side now, Sean? Ugh, you're really, really going to annoy our listenership with this. I mean, ah. you're really going to annoy Hey, me, it's a, it is a what, fun week. It. It's Let's a fun it. week for, for Real Salt Lake. No, it is. It, it's, der- it's Derby time. Yeah, Derby time, it's absolutely. Derby time. 
Right, the Rocky Mountain Cup Lake One happens this Saturday. Rocky Mountain Derby. Rocky Mountain Derby. Oh, we got it. I like the Rocky Mountain Cup. Okay, fine. I, the Rocky Mountain Derby does sound really good, though. It sounds very. It does sound very European, though. So I can see how a lot of Americans probably want to like that. So we'll just go with. <laughs> we'll just go with Cup. Rocky Mountain it's Cup. Cup. Leg one. Colorado Rapids coming to Rio Tinto Stadium Saturday night against Real Salt Lake. You can, of course, catch the match on KMYU, the illustrious KSL TV app, and also KSL.com. By the way, Sean, I know your employer is involved directly with these streaming these new Arsenal matches. I can't, I can't say anything. I can't give you a chunk of that sweet, sweet advertising revenue. I'm no, sorry. I'm just saying. I think it's fantastic. You guys have done a stellar job so far this season, and keep it up. Let's put it that way. I've, I've quite enjoyed it. Yeah, shout out to our director of programming, Lance Hope, out there. He he doesn't get a whole lot of limelight in there, but he's really the one kind of pulling the strings uh, yeah. on these live streams. So uh, big, big shout out to Lance. Give him some love. Okay, so yeah, absolutely. So Sean, coming into this match, both Real Salt Lake and Colorado have not had the ideal starts to their season, um, but this is a big match for both sides. Of course, Real Salt Lake coming off another big loss in New York, looking to bounce back. Um, you and I both were at training, uh, and we had a chance to catch up with Albert Rusnak, Justin Glad, Mike Petke, and we'll c- talk to Bofo Saucedo coming up here in just a minute. But all of them have acknowledged the fact that, yes, it, each time RSL has had a big loss this season, they have responded with, uh, with a win or getting points out of this the match immediately following that it's important that they do that again this week against Colorado to kind of right the ship again yeah Colorado comes in I think probably with the better run of form coming off of yes. a really big really big win over Toronto FC for them but both of these sides in general to start the season just two wins yeah. in five matches I mean that's not great and so if there's a team that you'd like to bounce back in this scenario in this incident being at home in a rivalry match uh, is probably Real Salt Lake, mm-hmm. who the last time they got thrashed, they responded with a gritty defensive defensive oriented win, picked up the full three points at home. Um, that was over Vancouver. Yeah, and and so you got to think that this that this is likely to happen again. You'd hope so. Uh, and, of course, the Rocky Mountain Cup, the fans love it. It's a fun time. Um, I don't think the players necessarily get into it as much, Sean. Not anymore. Not anymore. It used to, when it first started, it was very much that way. Of course, Kyle Beckerman making the switch from Colorado to Real Salt Lake had something to do with that. But I think that it's going to be a fun night of soccer. The weather's supposed to be pretty good. I know there was some bad weather coming in in the middle of this week, but Saturday night should be decent weather. So Yeah, definitely. And, and the... I one player I do have to give props to uh, for Colorado, although I'm probably going to make some enemies on this podcast. I'm just going to say it. Uh, RSL probably needs to probably needs to shut down Dominic Baji. Yes. Baji's coming in as one of the hotter goal scorers in the league. He's got four goals on the season. Uh, he'll be the best goal scorer, at least record wise, production wise, yeah. on the pitch this Saturday night. Mm-hmm. Uh, if if RSL's backline can't contain him. Uh, they might be in trouble. They might be a lot. Might make for a really long ninety minutes. Yeah, RSL fans did not want to hear that name. Of course, Baji was the player that may or may not have ended Tony Beltran's season, 2018 season before it even began because he hurt him in the end of 2017 with a horrendous but tackle. But he's coming out of the gates firing, I gotta admit. Yeah, he is coming out of the gates firing, but RSL fans are going to be less than enthused to see that guy on the pitch when Tony Beltran, their stalwart right back, is rehabbing long-term with an ACL tear, among other injuries, to his knee after a tackle that was only given a yellow card and I know Mike Petke was less than enthused over the results of that tackle. Yeah, get well soon, Tony. Absolutely. Not just a good player, good guy. Yeah. Good overall dude. Absolutely. Get well soon, man. Alright, um, Sean, so like I mentioned, we had a chance to catch up with Sebastian Bofo Saucedo. Talk to him a little bit about how he got his nickname, um, him being a local, being from Park City, Utah, playing professional soccer. We had a chance to catch up with him. This is our feature interview this week, so here it is. Sebastian Bofo Saucedo with Sean and I right here on Salt City FC. Here with Sebastian Bofo Saucedo. Uh, first things first, Bofo or Sebastian, do you carry the way? That doesn't matter. <laughs> okay, I want to start this off. We'll get to some of the serious stuff, but I want okay. to start off. Bofo, where does it come from? Oh, it's just from a Mexican childhood name where um, 
I was playing in the streets, and there was this famous uh, Mexican soccer player. He used to be bald, and mm -hmm. my dad used to always shave my head just because one of my uncles had uh, cancer. So then ever since then, it stuck to me, so it's kind of special. So how many of your teammates actually know what it, what the whole background is? I don't think many do. I think so just the close ones, the ones I went to the academy with, okay. you know, just the younger guys. But it's just, it's stuck. It's, it's both yeah. now. Okay. Yeah, it's both. <laughs> awesome. Right, it's a little bit of a Salt City FC exclusive for us. Yeah, so right. Appreciate that. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. I, uh, is the Bofo buzz cut going to make a repeat appearance anytime know, soon? Or? Probably. Maybe when, when uh, in the future, if I have to start something new, then I... I'll probably have to do it. Is that your version of the playoff beard? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I guess let's talk a little bit about the attack right now. You've been coming off the bench mainly so far this season. What have you seen from the forwards that you guys have done well and then conversely what you guys need to improve on? Yeah, well, I think it's, it's like a roller coaster. You know, sometimes we're at the very peak and sometimes we're very low and we don't score goals. And I think it's a matter of time because we've been – training them super well everyone has been doing really good i think everyone in training's finishing is uh spectacular and um i just feel like in the game sometimes you know it's it's, it's that slump where we haven't found the back of the net as much as we we, we as, as much as we did last year and i think uh once we get over this slump i think we're going to be an unstoppable team we just haven't clicked uh, as a team just yet but you know this time last year, we didn't have points, and we're happy to have seven points. And, you know, we're, we're looking to, to Colorado, which is an important game, rival game, and, you know, super excited to see what, what we can give to get three points here at home. You called it a roller coaster, and I'm, I'm sure you would rather have consistency in a lot of ways. But this team's ability to bounce back about two months into the season has been pretty impressive for you guys. You you have a rough performance one week and then some of the next week you look like world beaters you're you're winning games at home for the most part now you're really starting to establish an identity there is there something about this team's ethos that kind of makes you guys bounce back gives you that bounce back mentality i guess where you know you don't stay down for long well the thing is that i think if you ask every person on the team or giving your guys yourselves you guys don't like to lose I don't think we do either. You know, I think we have to go. We go out to the field, you know, knowing we're going we're to win the game, and that's what we want. But at the same time, we can't control over everything. You know, I think in general, there's there's times where where we want to do our best so we can give our fans a win, and you know, and we don't give that sometimes. And and you know, we always have to look forward to the next game, to the next game, to improve, to see what we can do. And and I think in general, we're 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 capable of doing that. I think, like I said. We're a great team looking forward, and, you know, we just have to click, and we'll be good. Colorado, it's a rivalry, the Rocky Mountain Cup. Do you see it as the biggest game in terms of rivalries for you guys, or is it just one of those games you have to go out and play? Yeah, it's a rival game. You know, obviously, we're playing for a cup, but I think our important game, our biggest game, is the next game that we play. You know, I think we have to look forward outside of Colorado. We have to focus on them, and then travel to Vancouver which is the biggest game after that you know what I mean so I think in general just your next game is the important game to be able to get a point or three points so I don't want to lose <laughs> fair enough that week to week mentality though you guys are already trying to kind of instill that even though it is it is still early I mean we're less than two months into the season but you're still trying to pick up that week to week pick up points pick up wins that yeah. kind of thing that's just important you know I think we were off by one point last year, and, you know, I don't think we were happy with that. You know, I think there was times where we look back and tell ourselves, wow, we should have won or we should have tied. But at the same time, we want to start out with a positive note. That way we don't struggle when we get to playoffs, you know. So that's where we're at. Okay, your, your bio says Park City, Utah. I know you grew up in Mexico part of your childhood. How much pride do you take in being a guy that's playing for his hometown team? That's yeah, like, well, I think it's, it's uh, super amazing for myself for the community here and you know for me to be the first homegrown ever in Park City you know in Utah in general I have all my friends around me my family and I think you know sometimes as a soccer player you get super comfortable when when um, you have everyone around you supporting you especially with you you know I think when I went on loan you know I had to work my butt off for for something different just because you know I was away I was in a different country and I was just doing my job for my family and and then friends, and I think now that you have everyone here, you you bring out everyone to the stadium. It's amazing to see that you know they're supporting you. But you know, I always have Park City in my heart. I live now in Salt Lake, but 
raised in Park City. It's an amazing city, and I love it. You know, who would have known that young kid in the mountains <laughs> coming out and playing soccer professionally? So. Yeah. How, how do you feel seeing the kind of the growth of the organization from when you were yay tall, that little kid, and growing up in Park City, to now, you know, not just RSL, but what you've seen with the Monarchs, the Royals coming in this year? You, you've kind of seen this organization grow every step in the way. Do you take a little bit more pride in that, too, because of that? Yeah, I think... Um, it's amazing to see, you know, what we built for the young, young talent, you know. And I think I sacrificed at the age of 15, well, 14, going to the academy, and it was in Casa Grande. And it was two years away from my family, and then, you know, it's tough. You know, we use, you lose a lot of friends, you lose, uh, you know, high school, like prom, all that type of stuff. And and I think, you know, as a kid, you try to enjoy that as much as possible because you will never get back and and, and enjoy that type of stuff again. And I think um, now they're, they have everything they need. You know, I think I go out to, to the Harriman facility and their apartment is better than my house. And I just <laughs> think it's amazing. So, <laughs> but I, 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 um, I'm all about, you know, young talent and future promises. And I think that's important in the U.S. soccer because I think there's kids out at the age of 15 now making full debuts in Europe, in Mexico, wherever, you know, and I think that's something that should change in the U.S. So. All right. Well, both will really do appreciate you taking the time. Best of luck this week, all right? Thank you so much. All right, there you go. Sebastian Bofo Sacedo. Um, I'm hoping we see a shaved head at some point, Sean. I think that would be absolutely hilarious and also inspirational to see Bofo kind of reliving his childhood in a way. Yeah, the Bofo buzz cut needs to make a return. Yeah, absolutely. I want to see the Bofo buzz cut. Make it happen. Well, you can tell he is quite proud of being a Utah native and playing in his home state, playing professionally here, and being a homegrown guy. Because you mentioned, yeah, I'm the first kind of homegrown player from the state of Utah to make it to this level. I think that he he takes a lot of pride in that. I think that he wants to continue to be kind of that pioneer. Like you mentioned, he mentions the fact that there's, there's these 14, 15, 16-year-old players that are making their international debuts. Well, I think he kind of feels a sense of pride having proven that, hey, guys from guys here in the States can, can play top-flight soccer. Yeah, and, and he, he grew up, he really came of age as a soccer player through that kind of uh, 2009, 10, 11 yes. years, the glory years, if you will, of Real Salt Lake. And and you can tell it's it's a little bit personal. He wants to bring this franchise back to those days mm-hmm. really, really badly. It's it's almost it is kind of personal for him in in many ways that I, I don't know if it necessarily is for a lot of players on any team, just because professional athletes nowadays, I mean, they're mercenaries. They go where they're paid. They they don't always settle into a community. Uh, th- this club is more than just a club for Bofo, and that's something that I think a lot of fans really like about him. Yeah, no, I, I I'm with you, and he plays at a breakneck speed. Um, I still think back to the Manchester United um, friendly last year, Sean. He came in and was just a general pest, and Jose Mourinho was less than happy about it. <laughs> Jose, what? Jose did not like Bofo. He did not. <laughs> but to me, if I'm Jose, I'd be like, dang, I want a player like that on my side that's just willing to come on and go at a breakneck pace regardless of who the competition is. That's, that's just how Sebastian plays the game. He hasn't started a match this year for Elsa Lake. I don't know. Even, did he start last year? I don't recall him starting a match Maybe last year. Maybe a couple times. Maybe a couple, yeah. But when he comes on, Sean, the energy level immediately picks up for Elsa Lake because he is just all over. Uh, yeah, and, and I mean, I think there are a lot of clubs, not just Manchester, although Jose, Manchester United, uh, if you really do want Bofo Salcedo, I'm sure he can be bought. Oh, sure yeah. You guys can afford him if you really want. Uh, but no, I mean, I, th- I think every team really needs a player like that. Uh, in addition to the local aspect, kind of being able to draw on the fan base, the community, the 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 state pride, if you will. Yeah. Um, every, every team also just needs a guy who will come in and do what he'll do, whether it's as a starter, off the bench, uh, whatever, in training, and just be a different type of player depending on what the game dictates. And, and that's kind of what Bovo Salcedo is. He can he can play out on the wing. He can play centrally. Mm-hmm. He can run a goal. He can drop back and kind of lob crosses into the box. I mean, he can he can do so much yeah. as an offensive player that I, I think it's really nice just having kind of that multi-tool threat. 
if yeah. you're RSL. Well, and he's fearless as well. I think that's one of the biggest things because he's not the biggest guy in the world, but he's fearless. He plays plays with that reckless abandon that you love. But we really appreciate him taking you're, the time to join us. You're allowed to say that. I can't talk about people's hype. <laughs> Fair enough. I don't know if I would one. So. <laughs> yeah, well, I really appreciate uh, both of taking the time to join us right here on Salt City FC. It was great to catch up with him. We'll be doing more feature interviews like that over the coming weeks. So let us know if there's there are players you want to hear from. And we're not limiting it just to Real Salt. Like, there's a Monarchs player or a Royals player you want to hear from. We will do our best to get them on the pod. And so, yeah, reach out to us, Salt City FC. Drop us a line at saltcitypod at gmail.com if you want to email us. Just let us know who you want to hear from and we'll do our best to acquiesce your request sean let's talk now about real monarchs here um best team in the state right now i mean by record certainly uh four oh and oh on the year that's three and oh away from home they yeah. only played one match at home uh and yet they're still unbeaten best start in franchise history it's a young franchise yes it merits saying it's the best start in franchise history um I think their toughest match of the season thus far, though, is uh, this Saturday, 5.30 p.m. Mountain Time, all the way on the other side of the country at Al Lang Stadium, yep. home of the historic Tampa Bay Soccer Rowdies. Yeah, the the Tampa Bay Rowdies is just a great name, all in all. Great logo, great brand yes. job. Yeah, they've done a good job Shout with out it. to the good people of Tampa Bay. And as weird as it is, Sean, as you, you pointed this out to me, I had completely forgotten this. They're a USL expansion side this year. They are an expansion team. Because they played in the NASL, which has ceased operations for at least this year. Yeah, so. one of about 15 teams that I think joined the league in the offseason. There you go. The USL is expanding at a breakneck pace that is crazy for better or for worse yes exactly one of the two. We, that's a, that's a topic for another we'll, podcast we'll, yeah, right we'll there that. yeah we'll hold on I'll to talk that to mark briggs about that maybe <laughs> exactly but yeah they go to the tampa bay rowdies this week i'm with you i think this is their toughest matchup to date and you mentioned the fact that sean they've been road warriors early on this season and it's gonna have to continue this week if they want to continue this un well it's undefeated un it's not unbeaten it's undefeated start here for for the real monarchs this season yeah, they've certainly been very good, scoring multiple goals in every match thus far. Like I mentioned, uh, every one of them away from home. Most recently, last Wednesday, 3-1 at uh, S2, Seattle Sounders 2, yep. which isn't quite the S2 of years past. No. Uh, I got to admit, I was a little bit underwhelmed by their overall style of play. Seattle fans are really going to hate me, but... They're they're a little bit down. Seattle fans can um, you take it you know where. Yeah, so. I, I don't. Well, I don't think there are many Seattle fans that are going to be listening to a podcast called Salt City FC. Quite frankly, hey, but if you are, thanks for listening. Yeah, thanks for the download. Appreciate it, guys. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you guys are the best. Don't get too mad at me. Uh, but yeah, I mean they they you know the Monarchs open the season. They scored three goals against Tulsa, uh, four against T two, three goals against Seattle Sounders two. Uh, picked up a one 0 win over at Phoenix, which is kind of the outlier right there. But yeah. Phoenix, tough place to play. Mm-hmm. Holding Didier Drogba off the score sheet's obviously pretty decent. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't care how old Didier yeah. Drogba is, like, and keeping him off of... Yeah, he's a thing. I mean, he's a thing. <laughs> yes. He's a guy. He's a guy. <laughs> so now now they've got one more home match at Tampa Bay. Like I mentioned, I road really match. think... Road yeah, uh, match. Yeah. yeah, one more road match uh, at Tampa, which I really think is the kind of the toughest of this road-heavy start to the season uh, because then April 30th, 7 p.m. is their opener at Zions Bank Stadium in Harriman. Yeah. They're going to be stuck there in that 5,000-seat stadium implant, Im, imprinting themselves uh, it's their that home, community. It's their home field. Yeah. Uh, so that Monday, April 30th, get out there, guys. I know Harriman seems like it's a long ways away, but it's really not. Uh, it's against Las Vegas Lights FC. The Saints and Sinners, baby. Yeah, Let's the, go. The fighting Freddy Adu's coming yeah. into town. Um, and then uh, after that, uh, they've got four straight matches at home at the really? Zions Bank Stadium. Okay. So, yeah, so a good chance to really get out, watch this side, the defending regular season, season champions in USL. And again, like you mentioned, Jake, if you're down on Real Salt Lake, if you're down on the first team, um, if you don't like what you're seeing there, there's a lot of promise coming up right now through the Monarch system, um, and I think it's only going to get better. Yeah, buy in right now. This is a buy low time for the Real Monarchs, even though they're off to a flying start. It's a time to kind of pay attention and see what what's coming up the pipeline for Real Salt Lake. So it should be a lot of fun. I, I'm excited to have those matches at Zions Bank. I, I, and you know me, Sean. I'm, I'm all about proximity to my home. And guess what? 
I'm totally cool with it being in Oh, heroin. yeah, you live close to heroin. It oh, takes, it, it legitimately as the crow flies, is maybe 10 miles from where I'm at, and it's it's a pretty quick drive for me. But I would, I'm with you, Sean. Get out, support these guys. That new stadium, I know it's only going to hold 5,000 people, but the, it looks top shelf. It, it's a great-looking stadium right now. Yeah, no, it's beautiful. I mean, it immediately becomes uh, one of the most state-of-the-art stadiums in the United Soccer League. So. Yeah. Uh, get out to that one April 30th, 7 p.m. We're really trying hard to pack that place. Um, I've uh, I've been in touch with the Monarchs, some of their staff members. Teaser alert. Uh, stay tuned to this feed. Next week, we'll have some extras for you from Mark Briggs and the Monarchs as they get ready for that opener. Sweet. That'll be awesome. Yeah, so yeah, Tampa Bay Rowdies this week. Best of luck to Mark Briggs and the rest of the Monarchs. Hopefully they can continue their unbeaten start to the season. We'll keep you updated on that. All right, Sean, we'll take a short time out here. We'll come back. Got to talk about some of the stuff that's going on in MLS. Also looked at some of the international news and notes. And of course, everybody's favorite segment coming up right at the end of the show, it's added time where we come up with stories that just don't fit in the other segments of this podcast, and we throw them out right at the end. So that's all coming up right here on Salt City. DFC. All right, welcome back to Salt City FC, Sean. Let's talk about stateside. There, are, well, there's two Champions Leagues we're going to talk about here, Sean. Let's start with the, with the domestic Champions League, the Concacaf Champions League. Um, the final is set. Featuring the best teams in the United States that play in Canada and Guadalajara, Mexico. <laughs> I dig it. I actually, wait, think that's great. Wait, <laughs> hold on. What? <laughs> Of course, I'm talking about Toronto FC. Yes. He was a Guadalajara. To, to translate for Sean here, Toronto FC, of course, the MLS um, side that is in the final here against Chivas or Chivas um, Guadalajara, one of the most storied soccer franchises in Liga MX. You know me, Jake. I, based on one quarter of my heritage, embrace our Canadian overlord. Based on one quarter. All right. Well, you have an avid listener who is full-blooded Canadian, so I'm sure he's quite proud there of you go. for that. There we go. So 20, the, 25% right here. Shout out to my grandma. Yeah, I don't... Shout out to my grandmama. The most Canadian heritage I think I can claim is the fact that my grandparents like to vacation in Vancouver. Does that work? I mean, I always thought you were at least three-quarters moose. But. <laughs> <laughs> Three quarters moves there. We go. I like it. That's that's good. All right, Sean. Yeah. So Toronto FC faces Chivas Guadalajara in the Concacaf Champions League. Uh, first leg tomorrow night. I think Toronto set up here to Sean to win it. Win it for MLS for the first time. What do you think? Yeah, they've really got to get off to a to a fast start. Tuesday night, eight fifteen Eastern uh, at BMO Field in Toronto. So they get they get that first leg at home. Um, but I agree. I mean, I, th- I think they're the team that comes into the CCL final with really all of the momentum. Uh, they just barely dispatched Club America in the semifinals. That's obviously a big win. They beat Tigres UNA, UNA mm-hmm. now, the, uh, Who legitimately, the Mexican League champion. Yeah, Tigres might be the best team that they've faced so far. Yeah, so, I, I mean, Toronto's got the momentum. They're playing well. And, frankly, I mean, Chivas kind of backpedaled into this uh, into this final a little bit. Um you know how many goals they scored in the uh, second leg against New York Red Bulls of that semifinal? Uh, I'll give you, a clue. you and I have as many. One. Yeah, so they had one <laughs> goal. They had exactly one goal across two legs. Uh, squeak past Red Bull Arena, nil nil yep. on the road. That gives them a one nil aggregate result. Uh, Red Bulls outshot them twenty to one. Yeah, that's see, that's the twenty to one in Harrison, New Jersey. That's the crazy thing. Yeah, about I mean it. that's just beyond me. Uh, but props to Chivas for making it as far as they did. This certainly was not the best team in League MX to mm-hmm. qualify for the CONCACAF Champions League. But as we know, through playoff structures and tournaments alike, March Madness has taught us this recently in college basketball. Uh, it doesn't matter what you've done, only that you get hot at the right time. Yep. Uh, the GOATs are certainly doing that. But, like I mentioned, they're running into a buzzsaw right now in Toronto FC, which could... It's, they're trying very hard to make a case for best MLS team of all time, and I think there's an argument, Jake. If they, okay, here's the thing, Sean. I, I've been I've heard that a lot. Them winning the treble last year, as they like to call it. They take home the Concacaf Champions League. This two year stretch for Toronto FC, it's hard to argue that it's not the greatest in MLS history. 
Yeah, well, I mean, I think you have to give it to them at that point yeah. of being the first ever MLS side to win the CCL. I mean, I, I think there's no question. And like I mentioned, I think even right now, just what they've done over the last, not just over the last year, but over the last two seasons, is really impressive. Um, and certainly compares to, say, like the 09-2010 RSL side yeah. uh, to the LA Galaxy a couple of years before that that won three in a row or three in four years, uh-huh. three MLS Cups in four years, Yeah, uh, somewhere in there. I mean, I, I, I think this Toronto FC right now is right up there with the best of the best that Major League Soccer has ever had to offer. Obviously, D.C. United from the early 2000s, pre-RSL, so maybe many of our listeners don't remember them too well, but... Yeah. But I think this TFC side is in a very select group right now, just with results, with how well they're putting it on the field, how much money they're spending. Oh, yeah. Um, they're certainly up there. Well, and the people will complain, well, they're spending a lot of money. Here's the thing, people. Money welcome old- to football. Yeah. Welcome to football first off. Yeah, welcome to football 101 right there. But, Sean, you also have to be smart about how you spend that money. Um, Because there are lots of clubs, and you know me, I'm a big Tottenham Hotspur fan. When they sold Gareth Bale, they went out and spent all that. They sold him to Real Madrid for an astronomical sum. They went out and spent all that money, and guess what? Guess how many players currently on that Tottenham Hotspur side are still with that club that came in that spending spree? Jacob Q. Hatch. Well, I'm a fan, so I guess that counts. No, there is one, Christian Eriksen, who's a pretty fine player in his See, own that's right. That's a good use of money. But they they spent all this money, and it gave, gave them nothing but one player. So, yes, you, you have to spend that money correctly. And, hey, best of luck to the Reds. I'll, I'll be rooting for them. I want to see an MLS club win this. And serve notice to Liga MX that MLS is serious about this, and they're going to win it. Yeah, worth, worth noting – uh, TFC in a little bit of a bind, potentially. Yes. They've got uh, five players that are a yellow card away from a potential suspension in mm-hmm. the decisive leg uh, next week, including Michael Bradley, Josie Alzador, Sebastian Giovinco. Oh, only, kind of their big three. only the best players yeah. on the team? Uh, so they're, they're, prob- they're going to have to be a little bit careful in this opening leg at BMO Field, but I think they need to come out hot. I think they need to score a couple goals. Um, and perhaps most importantly, keep a clean sheet out of this one. Prevent Chivas from getting uh, any of those decisive away goals. And that yes. can put them in a pretty good position for that final leg. Yeah, Drew Moore and company are going to be very important on that back line to shut down what Chivas is going to try and generate. Because, yeah, an away goal is as good as gold right now for Chivas. So we'll see what happens there. All right, Sean, let's flip to the other Champions League going on. And I almost feel like we have a similar setup in the semifinals for the UEFA Champions League as we did for the CONCACAF Champions League. You mentioned the fact that Chivas, um, Guadalajara kind of almost backdoored their way in. They just didn't have that that stiff a competition to make the final here. Well, the semifinals for the UEFA Champions League feature one side that has two Titanic heavyweights on one ch- in one semifinal and then two upstart surprise semifinalists on the other side. So the surprise semifinalist is Sean's favorite team to hate, the Liverpool Liverpool against um, Roma out of the, out, uh, out of Serie A in Italy. On the other side, like I mentioned, the two heavyweights, Bayern Munich, Real Madrid. So what do you make of this? Yeah, something's got to give. And uh, you know me, Jake, I'm better, better dead than red. That's what I always say. He's a proud Evertonian. But it's, but it's hard. It, I mean, it's hard not to take note of, shout out to our Utah Jazz fan listeners. Uh, it's hard <laughs> not to take note of what Liverpool has done through, through yep. this run through Champions League. I know their Premier League results have been a little bit up and down this year, certainly. But all anybody ever talks about is what happens in Europe. Uh, they come away with a big, big 2-1 win over Manchester City in that uh second leg of the uh, quarterfinals, 5-1 victory on aggregate there. And if I'm being quite frank, I think that might make them the favorite. It's hard to argue with that. I, I mean, this this Liverpool side, no offense to Roma, I think that should be a fantastic semifinal. Um, but but I, I think Liverpool should probably be favored yes. uh, in that one. And I, I almost wouldn't hate their chances against whoever emerges from the bloodbath. 
certainly, yeah. that will be uh, Bayern and Real Madrid. Yeah, Bayern and Real Madrid are going to go to war. It's going to be a fun semifinals. And one thing I like about this year's Champions League um, semifinals, Sean, is we've got four teams from four different countries. We've got Italy, we've got England, we've got uh, Germany, and we also got Spain. I like the fact that we have four teams from four different countries representing in this in this semifinal. It should be a fr- it should make for a fun final couple of rounds here for the best team in in Europe and potentially the world. Best yeah, club. Yeah, it's about time they started spreading the Euros around. <laughs> There you go. All right, Sean, um, let's take another short time out. We'll come back. Added time. We'll wrap things up, get our final thoughts in right here on Salt City FC. All right, Sean, as we wrap things up as we always do, here is added time. I kind of fit in some of the stories in the footballing world that don't necessarily fit in the rest of the podcast. Kind of those stories are a little bit out there. Um, Because I'm such a gracious co-host, I'm going to let you start us off this week. Uh, Well, Jake, I'd like to throw us ahead a couple uh, couple weeks now at this point to a little land called Russia. And the little team that you and I know as the U.S. men's national team is not going to be in Russia. True story. If I need to remind you. Which sucks. Uh, the United States crashing out of the World Cup, obviously, for the first time. Uh, in since pathetic fashion. Yeah, with a uh, couple of really just awful, awful results in CONCACAF qualifying. It obviously cost Bruce Arena his job. Uh, it probably cost several players their spot in the national team. Um, really most of the players their spot in the national team just a very very sorry qualifying cycle um, and uh, forward US manager Jurgen Klinsmann says uh, this failure to qualify for the 2018 World Cup has set the US Soccer Federation back quote by several years how do you feel let's get, let's dissect those words Kay. first um, is the USSF, have they really been set back several years by not qualifying for the World Cup? They have been set back, Sean, but in a way, it's actually a good setback because it's legitimately, it's, well, until Dave, Sar- Saracen, Saracen, how do you say the U.S. Men, Saracen. Saracen, the current the U.S. men, intern. the in- yeah. interim coach, okay, no offense, the fact that he's still managing this team bugs me to no end because... I was hoping, like, I'm hoping for a full reset on the U.S. men's national team. So, in that sense, Jurgen is right there because, yes, you mentioned players that lost their jobs. Sorry, Michael Bradley. Sorry, some of these veteran players, Josie Altador, that come to mind. That, yeah, your U.S. men's national team career might be done at this point, plain and simple. So, in that vein, I think Jurgen is right because I think the U.S. Soccer Federation wants to hit a full reset, build from the ground up, build with these young guys because they got four years until the next World Cup um, to qualify for it. So in that way, it, I, I get what you're going to say. And if that if that's was his kind of frame of mind when he was making those comments, if his frame of mind is it's sour grapes for him, okay, well I understand you were fired midway through this cycle. Fine, yeah. And you, you you still feel like you didn't get a chance to finish the job. You were replaced by a retread coach. So I, I just want to know what his frame of mind was when he made those comments. Uh, so Klinsman, in speaking with the European publication Kicker, uh, says this was a huge disappointment. The qualifi- qualification really was never in doubt. Okay. Which I think is debatable. Uh, but then the lads had a black a quote blackout versus Trinidad and Tobago. They only needed a point. We're too sure of that, and us underestimated that final match. Well, I fully uh, agree with that. Say, despite that low point, football in the U.S. is still on the rise, um, and then explains how there are other things that need to catch up, like the, the like the academy development scene, uh, college soccer, and so forth. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, I I think there's a lot of I feel like there's a lot of sour grapes here because because I. I feel like uh, hand wringing, and I mean this. This was a colossal failure by the United States to not qualify for the for the World Cup. Yes, I, I will say that. And I was upset. I was as disappointed. I was as sickened as anybody else 
um, that night in Trinidad when the United States couldn't even manage a single point <laughs> to at least make a playoff <laughs> for a World Cup yep. bid. Yep. Um, but I don't think it's a step back. I, I I do feel like this moment was kind of coming. I feel like this kind of had to happen for us to get better, yes. as you mentioned. Um, and I also think we're, we're not giving enough credit to the rest of CONCACAF. You know, we've 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 put out these really nice press release type quotes for the past several years about how the region is getting better and they're catching up and and look at the results from the Gold Cup and mm-hmm. teams are getting better and better and the United States and Mexico aren't going to be kingfishes for long and yada yada. Uh, and then when something something like this happens, we can't give a little bit of credit to Costa Rica or to Panama or to Honduras. I, I mean, I think a lot of credit has to go to kind of those middle teams, in particular, a, a team like Panama or Honduras, which mm-hmm. has been so up and down lately. Yeah. I think we need to give a lot of credit to them um, just for being in the race yeah. and for making the United States, a team like the United States, kind of have to win out and have to really earn their spot in the World Cup. Yeah. Um, I, I just I feel like we do a disservice to those nations, and and therefore we do a disservice to Concacaf in general by saying, "Oh, the United States messed up. Blow up the whole program. It's all the United States' fault." Like, well, no, I think yeah, yes, it's it's not good. It's not good. I don't I don't want to I don't want anybody to think that, you know, I think this is a good thing. Not me, not not qualifying, but I do also think we need to give a little bit of credit to the other nations uh, around our own. Yeah, it's a, well, that 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 mindset right there, Sean, is a very American centric mindset that most Americans have. Just USA is number one in their hearts, and I think. But I'm with you. I does need to credit. Well, I'm a proud. Yeah, uh, red, white, and blue. Yes, but leading a but, warm-blooded America. But you do need to give credit to the Concacaf nations. They're putting money into their national teams now. They're starting to invest, and you're seeing players. Costa Rica's got players playing all over the world now. Panama's starting to branch out a little bit too. So I think, it, in all in all, the U.S. men's national team has always struggled, and they got into the World Cup traditionally because they feasted on Concacaf competition to get to get there, and all of a sudden they show up and they're facing African, European federations that have played top-notch soccer top flight competition match in and match out all of a sudden u.s is like holy crap this is a whole nother level for us well guess what i'm glad Concacaf is up in their game because it's only going to help the u.s get better yeah and it's a great time for it to happen with the uh soon to be implemented Concacaf nations league and yes I think that'll help now those lower tier co- countries mm-hmm. get better and better um and i just i I'm totally with you. I, I think this is nothing but good for the United States in the long run. It sucks right now. It yeah. stings really, really bad. But we need to take that sting, and we need to make this program better, whether it's through changes at the top or at the bottom, at the grassroots level, with the current crop of players, with future players, whatever it is. Um, I think this can make our country that much better. Yeah, and one final thought. Jurgen Klinsmann is never short on opinion. I, and that's one thing I've always respected about him. That's true. It, I may not agree with it a lot of the time, but he is never short for opinion there. And guys earned it. He's won the he's won the World Cup at both pl- playing it and coaching it. So hey, he's a, he's entitled to his opinion. So there you go. All right, Sean. Mine's a little more on a lighthearted note as we go out here. Um, this comes from whatahowler dot com, one of your favorite sites. You introduced me to it last year, and I find it absolutely hilarious to go read about stuff on here. Um, this one actually stays in MLS. Uh, David Villa, he marked his 100th appearance for the club with a goal in their 2-1 win over LA Galaxy over the weekend. Well, New York City FC also honored another local legend in this match, Sean. The pigeon that was murdered by LA Galaxy R. players R. During, R. R. Their, during their free R. match, R. Their free match warm-ups in 2016 at Yankee Stadium. Um, a pigeon was on the pitch at Yankee Stadium in 2016. Uh, Galaxy players were warming up, and they decided to, they got closer and closer to the pigeon. They were, they were trying to scare it away. But this pigeon, man, it's like a, it was a true New Yorker Ooh, pigeon. Man, pigeons are fearless. Yeah. Pigeons, I don't understand why. Uh, so there's a new high school coming into your area yes. here, in, here in Utah. Cedar Valley. Cedar Valley that one i don't know why more high schools in america don't think about naming a pigeon as their mascot hey because pigeons are absolutely fearless man yeah. and well, like th- they do not back down and this pigeon did anyone. not this pigeon did not yeah 
The problem and is got the better of him. Yeah, the problem is that a soccer ball <laughs> may or may not have connected with said pigeon and ended its life. Well, here's the thing. So the Galaxy coming back to New York, of course, when you play when you're a Western Conference team like the Galaxy are, you only play an Eastern Conference team at the Eastern Conference team's home venue every two years. Well, Galaxy going back there over the weekend, NYC honored the pigeon by affixing a likeness of it to a pole behind one of their goals. Oh, so there you go. And they and they send out a tweet that says 8-20-2016 hashtag never forget. So I thought that was absolutely classic. I am with you, Sean. Pigeons are absolutely fearless. I I, I get why people wouldn't want to name it a pi- name it, have a pigeon as their mascot, but I'm with you. The fearless nature of pigeons, in and of itself, should give it more of a more of a I guess a, a bump when it comes to being considered as a mascot going forward for other teams. Yeah. So there you go. I thought it was kind of a funny story. I just want to see more pigeon mascots. Yeah. I want more. The Cedar Valley pigeons wouldn't necessarily work. They wanted to originally name it Lake Mountain High School. Lake Mountain Pigeons. Oh, the Lake Mountain Pigeons would have been great. That would be cool. They're oh, gonna be great. the they're gonna be the Cedar Valley Aviators. So at least they went with something a little more unique, I guess you should uh, say. It still should have been the pigeon. That would have been great. Or the buffalo. All right, Sean. Any final thoughts before we get out of here tonight? Uh no, just support local soccer. We've got some road teams, we've got some home teams this mm-hmm. week, but uh just support local soccer wherever it be, whether at the high school level, the club level, uh, the Premier Development League. Going to get back up uh, to uh, to play here in the next couple of weeks. So it's an exciting time in American soccer, no matter what Jurgen Klinsmann thinks. Exactly. All right, yeah, we will catch you next week. Hopefully we'll see you all out of the riot on Saturday night. Of course, Real Salt Lake, Colorado Ra- Rapids, the Rocky Mountain Cup. It- 2018 edition is here so it should be a lot of fun thank you so much for tuning in catch us on twitter at salt city fc drop us a note let us know what you think questions you have concerns whatever if you prefer email our email account for the podcast is saltcitypod at gmail.com and we'll be catching you later this week if not next week so right here thank you so much for tuning in to the salt city fc peace 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 peace